Uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Halfon. I'm a member of parliament for Harlow in the east of England, but also chairman of uh, the genocide group in parliament and vice chairman of the Kurdistan All Party Group. We, we have a set up a special committee to look at the, the genocide composed of academics, parliamentarians, and lawyers, and other experts. And if some people ask me why am I here today, I have very few, if any, uh, Kurdish people in my own constituency. But it's because I believe I have a, a moral duty as a parliamentarian to help nations who have suffered from genocide. Now with the all party group on Kurdistan, I have visited three times um, Kurdistan. And um, there is one statement that really sums up more than most why we are here today. And it was when um, I met with the Kurdistan the, uh, mass grave commission's head, who said there is another Iraq buried under Iraq. And it's strange to me that whilst the world knows about the modern genocide, the Bosnian by the Serbs, the tragedy of Rwanda, little is known about the Kurdish story in northern Iraq. In fact, as has been described this morning, their genocide, which is known to most as Anfal, is not even recognized as an international genocide by the United Nations, something that my committee in parliament is trying to do something about. Now, to me, the facts are these. If you define genocide as a scientifically planned mass murder with various stages of development, notably marginalization, demonization, and eradication, then the Kurds suffered a genocide. And we've seen today reports in the Times new pa newspaper that another uh, Ba'athist party uh, have possibly been using chemical weapons already, and it is all the more important that the United Nations condemns genocide and formally recognizes it where it has occurred. Now, um, in, from what I've learned about uh, the Kurds, they are a people that learns from the past rather than lives in it, but they have waited too long for justice. The state of Iraq now officially recognizes the Iraqi genocide and it's the duty of the rest of the world to do the same, to ensure that all the perpetrators are brought to the International Court and help with a program of education and remembrance so that the true story of Saddam's butchery can never be forgotten by future generations. And that really is the aim of the all-party group of MPs here in the United Kingdom. As has been described, our e-petition has over 25 thousand signatures. Now it gives me enormous pleasure today to welcome a group of experts um, to, to speak to you uh, this morning. Peter Galbraith, who's going to uh, speak now, he's an author, academic, commentator, policy advisor and former United States diplomat. Professor Gareth Stansfield, Senior Associate Fellow and Director of Middle East Studies at the Royal United Services Institute and Director of the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, my old university. <coughs> Tom Hardy Forsyth, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister of the Kurdistan Regional Government and also a former NATO Senior Committee Chairman. And finally, Ian Hansen, Deputy Director of Forensic Science, Archaeology and Anthropology Division on the International Committee of Missing Persons. Peter, can I welcome you to the platform? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> I want to speak uh, first as one of a handful of Westerners who was uh, a witness to the genocide as it was unfolding. And I think Gwen Roberts may be one of the only others, and uh, I may be one of the very few, perhaps the only, who was actually in a governmental capacity, because at the time I was working for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I'd like to talk about the silence. 
because the story is more complicated than it has been presented. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge uh, several of the people uh, who did so much to educate me uh, about what was going on, and therefore the basis of what I can say. Uh, we've already heard from Dr. Mahmoud, uh, who was in Washington, and I, although we wouldn't see people, people from the State Department wouldn't see him, the Foreign Relations Committee, I did see him. Uh, and he was joined by uh, Sami Abdel Rahman, uh, who was a great figure and very much missed, uh, and uh, Jalal Talabani, uh, who we also think of in this moment, uh, the president, now the, amazingly, the president of Iraq. Nobody would have thought that 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, we obviously all wish him a very speedy recovery. Um, but <clears throat> uh, my encounter with the genocide began in 1987, when for some very peculiar reasons that would consume all my time where I, to explain them, I got permission to go into Kurdistan, uh, and as I crossed um, from Jalala into the Kurdish region, I was struck by something. The absence of the villages that appeared on the very detailed military maps that I had. And you could see then, as you went further, the systematic destruction of the villages. On the one side of the road, abandoned houses and buildings. On the other side, bulldozers in the process of, of, of making rubble out of them. And beyond, you could see where people were being located, relocated into what were called victory cities, but another word for concentration camps. Uh, <clears throat> and then came in 88, Halabsha, which, uh, the, which is very clear that Iran never used chemical weapons in the Iraq-Iran war. But the fiction was put out at the time and even perpetrated today by a couple of what I would call you know, the Kurdish equivalent of Holocaust deniers, that it was the Iranians who did it. That we know is a, an absolute lie. But what we have to remember is Halabsha was not the only incident. And when I hear that the go Iraqi government has recognized Halabsha as genocide, I think, well, what about all the other uh, villages that were attacked? Perhaps the most clear-cut case in terms of responsibility took place between the 25th and the 28th of August in the Dahak governorate. 25th and 28th of August, 1988. Now, why is that significant? Because the Iran-Iraq war had ended on the 20th of August, and Dahak is, as all of you here know, far from the Iranian border, up by the Turkish and Syrian borders. 49 villages were attacked. Uh, I, uh, the moment I saw that, I was in my home in Vermont. I went back to Washington, talked to the chairman of the committee, Claiborne Pell, who's another real hero of this story. Uh, he said, what we should do? I said, well, we should at least threaten sanctions. So we we drew up a bill, uh, uh, called it the Prevention of Genocide Act, got Jesse Helms, a right-wing Republican co-sponsor, along with Al Gore and Ted Kennedy, got it through the Senate in, in a day. And if you know anything about the U.S. Congress, the idea that anything could happen in a day is quite amazing, even 25 years ago. Uh, complete sanctions on Iraq. Uh, and what was the, and, and then actually after that, to prove the case, I and uh, junior aide Chris Van Hollen, who likely will be the next Democratic Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives now, uh, went along the Iraq-Turkey border and we interviewed the survivors. Uh, and it, there wasn't the slightest doubt about what had happened because there were 65,000 survivors. Every one of them was an eyewitness to the actual attacks and you could compare stories of people who ended up in different places in Turkey but were from the same villages in the Dahak governorate. Anyhow, the bill passed unanimously in the, the Senate largely because I think everybody saw the title and nobody knew quite what was in it. Uh, then the special interests went to work uh, and in the House of Representatives it was weakened. And then the Reagan administration said, first it said yes, Iraq used chemical weapons on the Kurds. They didn't dispute that. In fact, they had intelligence intercepts proving it. But their next response was sanctions even cutting off the $700 million a year the U.S. was giving Iraq in 1988. That was, it was, that was too extreme a response to, what, to, Saddam, what, to, to, to Iraq gassing the Kurds. Now, ironically, the very same people who had argued that, that this response was premature when it was going on, when the, when the genocide was actually taking place in, 2000, in 1988, 
In 2003, those same people, Dick Cheney, Colin Powell, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, said the fact that Saddam had gassed his own people was a reason for the war. Uh, you know, it, what turned out to be a trillion dollar cost to the United States and, and many lives, and while uh, uh, undoubtedly the people of Iraq ended off better off for it, uh, uh, probably the United States did not. But anyhow, so it, 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 there was something uh, that actually uh, happened at the time, uh, and there was a response, and the, the, the response was, it wasn't just that people ignored it, it was that they decided actively not to do anything about it. Now, why? Well, the initial reason for the tilt toward Iraq was the Cold War. The belief was that Saddam could be another Sadat. Yes, he was a strong man, but he could be flipped from being pro-Soviet to being pro-American. Uh, and later, as the Cold War was winding down, the notion was that Saddam would be a good bulwark against the Iranians, and indeed the Reagan administration was deeply embarrassed of, at this time because it had been caught out shipping arms to Iran in the arms for uh, hostages uh, scandal. Uh, and then, of course, there was the notion that uh, Iraq was going to be building after the Iran-Iraq war. It was going to be a great place for American business. Uh, but there was a flaw, and the flaw was not, was absolutely, there was a moral flaw with this argument. Absolutely, it was a moral flaw. But there was a strategic flaw. And the strategic flaw was this. A regime that would commit genocide against its own people, that would attack villagers with chemical weapons. But and, and there, in, in many ways, there's too much focus on chemical weapons, because it's still genocide if you kill people with machine guns or you starve them, and all of that was going on. That a regime that would commit genocide against its own people, never mind have an unprovoked attack a, in, on its neighbor Iran eight years earlier, was not the sort of regime that was likely to be a reliable partner. And that, of course, was proven on the 2nd of August, 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, something that uh, uh, made it, uh, was turned out uh, to change everything uh, both for Iraq uh, and the uh, Kurdish people. So my, my point is very simple here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, uh, uh, first, that, we, we, that genocide uh, is not just about specific incidents. It's something that's much broader. It's defined by the Genocide Convention as a crime with the intent to eliminate a group in whole or in part. And so Halabsha can't be genocide. And for that matter, as Samantha Power described, eliminating rural Kurds, which she says was the genocide, isn't really the genocide. It is a crime of intent, and there is a process. And the process was on the part of an Arab nationalist regime who basically viewed the Arabs as the master race, the Kurds as interlopers in the country of Iraq. Uh, a, a, there was a logic to this that began with the uh, clearing out the, the elimination of the villages, declaring no zones where if anybody went they would be killed, the use of chemical weapons. And had it not been interrupted, I think it would have continued to the large-scale elimination of the entire uh, Kurdish population uh, of Iraq. And the second point I would make uh, is that uh, uh, genocide and human rights are not a luxury item. Uh, they actually are fundamental to sound strategy. Uh, again, because the kinds of regimes that do these things are the kinds of regimes that are dangerous, dangerous to security, dangerous to a peaceful world. And so even if you're not a bleeding heart, it's very much worth standing up to it, and it's incredibly important that we now recognize internationally what happened in Kurdistan and that we keep our eyes open to the other cases. It's easy to recognize these things 25 years later, but it's important to recognize them as they are actually taking place. Um, I'd like, now like to welcome Professor Gareth Stanfield to the podium. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert, and um, my thanks to Diane Khan for giving me the honour to speak to you today and um, to, to address uh, your excellencies and, and distinguished guests. Uh, my own involvement with Kurdistan goes back to 1996 as a relatively fresh-faced 23-year-old arriving at uh, Kakfala's door um, to assist in humanitarian aid work uh, funded by the British government. Very quickly, I was confronted with the reality of Kurdistan uh, and was shown very quickly the, the destruction in the villages caused by the seven or eight rounds of Anfal, depending on how you count them, um, and also the deep psychological, emotional trauma that existed amongst individuals and collectively amongst the people of Kurdistan as well. A psychological trauma that will still take decades to recover from, even though I think Kurdistan, its leaders, its people, are more forward-looking than ever before. I've been asked today to talk about ending the silence. Um, I'm going to pose a question about why should we end the silence and why should anybody listen? These may seem uh, obvious questions to ask, but I think they lead to some interesting answers. It is, of course, important because genocide of the Kurds and the Anfal and other events constitute probably the most painful episode of mass killing to take place against the Kurdish people uh, in particular and against humanita humanity in general in the 21st century. This isn't too, too much of an extreme comment to make. Genocide of the Kurds should sit with the canon of genocide against other peoples in the 21st, in the 20th century and before that. But it's also important because the genocide of the Kurds has several uh, specificities, perhaps, that need recognizing and that haven't fully been recognized in a broad sense uh, to date. If for no other reason as to act as warnings for the future in Iraq and in other places affected by war, civil war, ethnic tension and conflict. So was the Kurdish genocide unique and does this actually matter? Well, of course it does matter whether it's unique or not. Uh, genocide needs to be recognized, uh, its perpetrators identified, and a process set in place in order to rehabilitate, rectify, and allow societies to move on. Where Kurdish genocide is perhaps unique is a combination of the role of the state uh, in the implementation of the genocide and the planning process, the meticulous, very detailed, long duration planning process that underpinned not only the Anfal campaign, but several rounds of planning, blueprints, proof of concepts that went on before that. And I, I will refer to some of these afterwards. Along with the Holocaust, the Kurdish genocide saw not only mass murder committed by the state on an industrial scale, it did witness this meticulous, this detailed planning that came from uh, the, the very highest levels of government within the Ba'ath regime and all the way down to the different governorates of Iraq, uh, to the different military commands, to the different security services. It was a meticulousness in conception, in design, in timing, in implementation, and combined with a very sophisticated external relations shrouding uh, and, and disguising of the act, all aimed at the systematic and systemic destruction and deconstruction of Kurdish society and by extension, the Kurdish rebellion that had been going on against the Ba'ath regime since 1961. However, genocide in Iraq went beyond preventing rebellion. Unlike other examples of genocide, I would argue, the one injured by the Kurds was arguably driven not, by, not fully by a context of war. We can trace genocide in Iraq perhaps to Arabization policies, which some academics would take back to the 1930s even, and a, a wider discourse and a wider narrative of the implement, implementation of a, a notion of dominant Arab nationhood. War, in some ways, was a secondary feature of Kurdish genocide, perhaps, even, perhaps a catalyst, certainly an excuse, certainly an opportunity for those wishing to perpetrate it. For scholars who follow genocide, war is often a ne necessary context for the act to take place. But with the Kurds, I'm not sure that this is actually uh, true. The blueprint, for example, uh, and there is some very interesting work being done on this um, by, by figures in Kurdistan, uh, would suggest that the Faili Kurds and the suffering of the Faili's um, in the 1970s to 1980s was in some ways uh, a blueprint for the acts that then would follow. Proof of concept, perhaps, uh, in the targeting of the Balzanis later, 
before we get to the full-scale systematic depopulation of the rural areas and the processing and elimination of Kurds uh, of a variety of different political backgrounds and activities. The Kurdish genocide also occurred in an environment of an overwhelming sense of Arab dominant nationhood, infused, I would argue, by Islamic legitimacy uh, as well. This is, again, not necessarily unique, but it's a very important factor to take into account today as we once again see in Iraq the rise of a notion of dominant Arab nationhood and the rhetoric and the narrative and the discourse of Anfal, of genocide, of the oppression of those who oppose the regime is once again rearing its head. Arguably, Anfal and genocide have not been eradicated from the mindset of Iraq collectively at this point. And indeed, there are some very worrying signals coming from uh, groups, from individuals across Iraq that what the Kurds suffered in the past may come back to, uh, to haunt them in the future. These points and others suggest very strongly that we should seek to end the silence on genocide in Iraq. But indeed, it's more the case that we should find a way to get people to listen to the, about the genocide on Iraq. Since Richard Beeston reported this in the Times, Gwyn Roberts, of course, there has not been a shortage of news, a shortage of resources, a shortage of academic work on the subject of the Anfal and Kurdish genocide. But there has been a shortage of those who are willing to listen, who are those willing to act upon this information within government, amongst politicians, even with journalists and academics. That's notwithstanding the, the highly important work of figures such as Kanan Mikia, who wrote Cruelty and Silence, an account not only of the, of the genocide of the Kurds, but more importantly, perhaps, the silence of Arab regimes, regional powers, and the international community about the events. For reasons of geopolitical realities, geopolitical imperatives, geographical isolation of the Kurds, and the exceptional planning process that under, underpinned the mass murder and the deception activities of the Ba'ath regime, the genocide has never attained its rightful place in the sad canon of human suffering as other examples of genocide have done. This desperately needs to be rectified. We are all being naive if we believe that the tragedy of the past cannot again become realities of the future because of the complacencies shown in the present. Thank you. Tom, would you like to come to the platform, please? A shocking crime was committed on the unscrupulous initiative of few individuals with the blessing of more and amid the passive acquiescence of all. These words were actually written by the Roman historian Tacitus nearly 2,000 years ago, unfortunately. Things don't seem to have changed very much. I've been introduced as uh, special advisor and uh, a former NATO chairman. I'm not going to speak to you mainly as that today. I'm going to speak to you from the point of view of a British army captain who arrived in in the spring of 1991 in the mountains of Kurdistan. These few, past few days remembering this has been very painful for me. It was unimaginable, the suffering that was going on in these mountains then, the mud, the stink, children dying of dysentery. We arrived, the British Army and others, to try and put a stop to what had happened following 
the, uh, the failed uprising and our disgraceful failure having called for it, not only to support it, but to actually give Saddam the means to continue it by allowing his helicopter gunships to continue to fly and kill civilians. When I arrived as, as a soldier, you know, you, you sort of expect destruction on the sort of scale that a short, sharp conflict does. But that isn't what we saw. What we saw and heard was this word that was repeated everywhere by ordinary people in the mountains, terrified out of their lives to return back. Anfal, anfal, anfal. And as we went round, we saw village after village after village that couldn't have been destroyed in five minutes or a year. And when I say destroyed, I mean done so meticulously and with the sort of industrial planning that we've heard about. What really uh, summed up for me was you kind of, you, some of the people here must have been up in these mountains, but you, you know, if you saw the suffering that they went through, but yet the, terror, the complete reluctance, no matter how we tried to convince them that it was safe, to come back down. Complete reluctance, not reluctance, terror. And this was what we were up again. They preferred to stay, take their risk, die in, in a period when snow was melting, mud, rather than go down again at the risk of the same thing happening again. Frankly, it was because they were used by now to casual betrayal by us. Casual betrayal. When we eventually did coax them down, rather than go to prepared UNHCR camps and promises of food and so on, they still preferred, and I saw this, this, this exodus back to their devastated villages. And we basically had to follow them and set up mobile support teams. Now, why was that? The simple reason was that these people already had an inkling that if they went to these camps and they were disarmed the usual way, you know, and put in these positions, great. They would now be again sitting ducks for Saddam, no matter what we promised them, and they weren't prepared to take that risk. And boy, I tell you, at that moment, you know, they were right. Because as these people were coming down off the mountains at the end of spring in May, we went to a staff meeting at the military headquarters just outside Zako. And we were briefed by our American commander in charge of Operation Provide Comfort or Safe Haven, whatever you want. And it was announced at that meeting that all allied military forces who were involved in Provide Comfort were leaving by June and were going to be replaced by a United Nations Guards contingent of Iraq, which frankly was barely able to protect itself. In fact, did not have a remit to protect anybody, just to observe. Well, fortunately, for once, this was too much for some of the officials at that meeting to swallow. I, I'll, I'll say it without exaggeration, there was almost a punch-up at that meeting. And for once, it was one silence too many. So some officials, including this one, went back to the UK. I actually resigned my commission publicly on Newsnight, and the newspapers the next day, and this is one of them, John Major's Haven Plan in tatters. And this was actually waived in Parliament the next day. What I'm saying to you is that I'm not taking away what John Major and the politicians did, but the only reason that they did it was because the media and the cameras were rolling. As soon as they stopped rolling and they went away, 
It was going to be business as usual. And as far as Saddam was concerned, this wasn't a full stop. It might have been a comma or maybe just a semicolon, but once we were gone, it was going to be business and anfal as usual. Not something in the past, but something that was just going to continue. And I'll tell you, during the five years I continued to be there after that, you know, and in fact up until 2003, there was plenty of evidence that every effort was made to continue it. Right. But of course, because of the decision, because of this protest of poised hammer, fortunately, uh, he wasn't allowed to do so. I want to finish off, because I've been given strict limits, and I'm going to keep to them, by mentioning something which might not make me very popular in some places, but I've never been one for popularity or beauty competitions, as my daughter will tell you, who's sitting here, a new generation helper and a barrister. As far as I'm concerned, there were two distinct phases in Anfal. The first phase, as we know, was the very carefully organized destruction of villages, infrastructure, agriculture, the shipping of people to the desert, mass killings, and so on. That was one aspect. That was carried out by ground forces. Most of the gas bombing, VX, mustard, and so on, were done by fixed-wing aircraft. And it was only by having access to these aircraft and these sophisticated weapons that that part of the Anfal could ever have been carried out. Why is that important? Well, I'll tell you why. We now have a government in Baghdad which has still got a long way to go. They still have to, in my view, prove their democratic, their constitutional, and their human rights credentials. They have a long way to go yet. And yet, at this very moment, the American government is going to sell them F-16 fighter bombers. Now, we'll look at what's been happening in Syria. Now, what are these fighter bombers for? Are they to protect them against Iran? I don't think so. Are they to protect them against Turkey, Syria, Jordan? No. These bombers, the only real long, short to medium use for them possibly could be, would be to kill their own civilians when they, when they don't agree with the government. I am really scared that an American government that must be so strapped for cash because of the fiscal cliff that they are prepared to allow us to sleepwalk into another possible mass tragedy. You see, Anfal and this sort of destruction isn't something in the past. It casts its cloud and its shadow now, and it requires us all to exercise constant, unending vigilance. I'd like to end up with the words of the English poet uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. To suffer woes which hope thinks infinite. To forgive wrongs darker than death or night. To defy power which seems omnipotent. To love, to bear, to hope, till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we hope, and yes, we even forgive, but never ever should we allow ourselves for one moment to forget. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Tom. As someone who was out on the ground at the time, that was uh, outstanding and very moving, uh, very moving as well. Um, uh, I now welcome Ian uh, to the platform. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and on behalf of the International Commission on Missing Persons, um, I'd like to thank the organisers and um, uh, my fellow speakers and all guests for the uh, chance to provide some insight into the potential for my organisation's work to expose genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, I've listened to the comments from our panel with great interest and I hope I can add something to the discussion and show how practical assistance in finding physical evidence of past events denies the silence. The graves and bones tell their story. The identified dead are given a voice once more. ICMP has been assisting the Iraq government and the Kurdish regional government since 2008 through our capacity building program. Our mandate is to secure the cooperation of governments and other authorities in locating and identify persons missing as a result of armed conflicts, violations of human rights and also disasters. ICMP also supports the work of other organisations in their efforts, encourages public involvement and contributes to the development of appropriate expressions of commemoration and tribute to the missing. We're all very well aware of the past events, including Anfal, that have led to Iraq's tremendous missing persons problem. But it's not only an issue of grief and of justice, it is a civil society issue that unless revealed and resolved, contributes to political instability in the present. Exposing the facts concerning the crimes committed in Iraq by gathering physical evidence of events and identifying the missing is vital in several ways to address the longing of families for answers and the return of mortal remains or their loved ones, to give families effective justice and compensation, to build political cooperation and trust, to prevent the denial of genocide and revisionism, and to provide deterrence to those who would consider emulating such atrocities. ICMP has, through its working experience in the Balkans and elsewhere, develop practical solutions to these needs, helped by the generous support of the international community and national governments. The government of Iraq is clearly determined to try, and ICMP stands ready to assist, in facilitating the development of a strategic approach to addressing these issues. Accordingly, ICMP believes very strongly it's the responsibility of government to address the issue of all missing persons from armed conflict, crimes against humanity, and other violations of human rights, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin. To assist, ICMP opened offices from 2008 in Baghdad and then Erbil with the aim of providing advice and practical support. So in the last five to six years, we have assisted in training national teams to investigate mass grave sites, undertake examinations, gather evidence, we are mentoring and recording and documenting evidence and events in accordance with the legal requirements uh, of Iraq and Kurdistan. We're advising in the management and logistical support of investigations, assisting in coordinating family and victim groups to empower them, providing training in how to collect information on the missing from surviving family members, training in collecting um, and development of teams to collect blood samples from relatives to assist in a DNA identification process, training and collecting of DNA samples from the bones of victims to match to the blood samples, providing extensive database systems and scientific processes so that data can be collected and coordinated, analyzed and managed. And lastly, we're providing access to our own DNA testing laboratories in Bosnia so identifications can be made while Iraqi national capacity is being developed. To date, ICMP has trained over 170 persons from the Ministry of Martyrs and Unfound Affairs, the Ministry of Human Rights, and the Medical Legal Institutes across Iraq. 
More than 200 grave sites have now been examined by the ministries. Several thousand uh, cases recovered and evidence provided for the courts and for identifications has been collected. The teams from across Iraq have worked together to reveal and document the evidence of crimes and genocide. The progress Iraq has made should be recognized. In 2006, Iraq created a law on the protection of mass graves which provides a coherent legal mechanism for locating missing persons and gathering the evidence. International agreements have also been signed and bilateral processes aimed at locating persons who disappeared during previous armed conflicts undertaken. However, there are further policy and strategic issues that need to be addressed. Further legal and ministerial coordination will benefit the search for these missing people. ICMP encourages development of a national mass graves working group to build collaboration in which can be advised on what can be done to address this great problem. And coordination is essential. The scope of the problem remains enormous. A reported minimum 180,000 dying in Anfal alone. To reveal the physical evidence of these crimes so that the facts cannot be denied will require decades of work. A united list for Iraq is needed to provide accurate demonstration and evidence of who is actually missing. Strong civil initiatives to support and inform families and communities must be built. And if the dead are to be identified, perhaps one million blood reference samples will be needed from surviving relatives. Thousands of graves will need to be located and excavated. Hundreds of thousands of cases, the bodies of the dead need to be found and examined, as well as their clothing and personal effects documented, conserved, and stored. So this is a huge national task. But even as we assist the teams and provide advice, ICMP has successfully generated DNA profiles from bone samples provided to us by Iraq in our labs in Bosnia. ICMP has pioneered a successful and unprecedented DNA-led approach to mass grave victim identification that in the Western Balkans has identified 70% of the people missing from the conflicts there. And that work is ongoing in the Balkans after 17 years. A DNA-led approach to identification stands as the only viable general approach to identifying large numbers of victims in cases such as ANFAL. ICMP has developed advanced technical capabilities and has an established track record of transferring this expertise to government institutions and this has begun uh, in Iraq and, in, and cooperating with the Kurdish regional government. We are also advising on the essential issue of data protection and safeguards. Iraq needs to develop privacy laws concerning genetic data use. DNA and personal information provided through informed consent should be used for this purpose only and needs to be suitably protected. In conclusion, our experience in the Balkans is showing that the missing can be identified and physical evidence gathered. The scientific techniques, investigative processes, data management systems required have now been developed and this can lead systematically to the provision of physical evidence of genocide and crimes against humanity. The dead can be known and they can speak again. Recovering victims of the Anfal and Halabja will be an immense technical and logistical challenge which will require international support, contributions and collaborations of different organizations to succeed. But it can be done. It is our hope and our belief that the Kurdish regional government will rise to the challenge to meet this um, great problem and that in time a great number of Iraq's missing from all conflicts, may be returned to their families. Thank you.